figure we'll give it another couple of minutes while people online trickle in. Because so far you're the only one online. And I know there's gonna be more, I know it. Can't promise a full length class tonight because uh, I went home early from work for uh, migraine and I thought it was good. And now that I'm looking at the screen over here, it kind of feels like an ice pick is driving through my head. <laughs> so migraines are fun. <laughs> okay, well, one thing the migraines do is make me a little impatient. So I'm just gonna go ahead and start. I waited one minute as somebody shows up. All right, cool. <laughs> All right, so for tonight, uh, we're gonna be doing review on last class, of course. I like to do that. Uh, and then we'll move on to the next stuff, which is units of measurement. That's gonna be stuff like, you know, cups, quarts, millimeters, gallons, all, all that fun stuff and converting between different levels of it, uh, which is always everybody's least favorite thing. Um, past that, uh, if we get past the, uh, units of measurement. I have a nice long stretch of percentages to cover, which I know is everybody's favorite thing after after fractions. So we'll be playing around with some of that. And normally I load these with memes, but I totally did not this time because I finished this slideshow at 11 p.m. last night. Ben's a little tired. Okay. So starting off, Last class, we did quite a bit on exponents and scientific notation. So if you recall, uh, we did some dividing exponents and we did negative exponents. So when you're dividing exponential numbers that have the same base, all you have to do is keep the same base, but subtract the bottom power from the top power. Um, so if you have two, I like that I wrote it that way, but I totally did not write it in a fractional form first. Memorizing the exponent button on Google Slides has been very useful. So if you have two to the fifth over two squared, then what you can do is take the top power and subtract the bottom power. So you'll have two to the five minus two, which gives you two to the third. And depending on the problem, you might very well go ahead and solve that. That'll end up being an eight. If it's big, horrifying, and gigantic, don't worry about solving it. If it's nice and neat, like two to the third, that's easy enough to do, so you can go ahead and do it. And then when dealing with negative exponents, you flip them to the other side of the fraction bar and they become positive. If you remember, it's kind of a, a reciprocal thing. I didn't really like using the term reciprocal for this, but it is, it's effective. Uh, so if you have two to the negative fifth, that becomes one over two to the positive fifth. So wherever that negative exponent is, it just jumps to the other side of the fraction bar. So if you have a negative exponent on the bottom, in fact, I'll write up one real fast next to it. So if I have say one over, uh, I don't know, three to the, Oh my God, that was the wrong button. Three to the negative third, I'll make it a four just so you can differentiate. 
that would be the same as three to the positive fourth. And you wouldn't have to put that over one because everything's over one, everything is itself. Okay, so of course I have a bunch of random examples on that. I like examples. Reading about math is one thing, but actually doing it is another. So there's, I mean, reading about, about math really accomplishes almost nothing if you've ever tried to teach yourself a class or something. I've done it, it's just awful. I'm gonna write out some of these real quick. Did I really, I almost replicated one of my examples in the last slide when I decided to make something up. Okay. So most of these are pretty basic, except for the last couple. So if you understand the concept of the last slide well enough, you should be able to do most of these. The other ones are a little tricky, that's okay. So for our first one, we have eight to the third over eight to the seventh. So all we really have to do there Remember, we do top power minus bottom power. Oh, but three minus seven, that ends up being a negative number, right? We have eight to the negative four. So what are you gonna do from there? Well, remember, anytime you have a negative exponent, it jumps to the other side of a fraction bar and becomes positive. Right now we don't have a fraction. So it ends up being one over eight to the positive fourth. Now at this point, if you felt like throwing that into a calculator, that's cool. If not, I'd say eight to the fourth is right on the edge of whether or not you would be expected to do it. If you do go that far, it ends up being one over 4,096. It's not too bad because really eight to the fourth is eight squared twice, eight squared is 64. So this is probably whatever 64 times 64 is. I didn't know that. I'm not gonna remember that and neither are you. Not wildly important. As long as you can actually do the, do the steps, it's not really a big deal. Now for number two, we have larger powers which usually terrifies people, but it follows the exact same rules. Same base, top power 96 minus the bottom power 92. Well, that's not bad, right? 96 minus 92, that's just four. I absolutely didn't intend on having the first two problems end up with the fourth power, whatever. So this ends up being five to the fourth is, I believe it's 625. I think I've done that a lot uh, enough times. Double checking. Yep, 625. Okay. And for number three. We have three to the negative fifth. So the same thing here happens with what we did on number one over here. We have a number to a negative exponent. So it ends up being one over that number to the positive version of that exponent. And fourth powers are one thing, fifth powers, I really don't wanna throw something to the fifth in my calculator. So we're probably good. 
if I want to, if I want to guess, I'm going to say that's probably 243. Because I've done, done this too much. It sure is. This is what happens when you do too much math. These numbers start sticking in your head. I'm not some magical wizard who can do three to the fifth in my head. I've just done this a lot. If you can do that in, in your head, more power to you. That is awesome. I cannot. Okay, so number four, we have one over five to the negative third. Don't think we've had one over an exponent at this time yet. No? Okay. So if it has a negative exponent, it jumps to the other side of the fraction bar. So in this case, you'll end up with a five to the third on top. We don't really have anything on the bottom because we don't, we really don't have to put it over one. We would normally you would say you're flipping this and making the power positive. Um, but this is one of the reasons why I don't like to describe it that way. I like to say it's jumping to the other side of the fraction bar because that applies on top and bottom. Makes a little bit more sense in my head. So at this point, all you really got to do is multiply that out. Five to the third is one less five than this guy. So it's actually 125. Because five squared is 25 and another five on top of that means you have five quarters. That's a buck 25. It's cheap, but it works. And actually these next couple are the reason in this slide, so tonight's slides that I kind of abandoned the wording that I've found where it says to use the reciprocal. Um, like I said right here, I don't really like that wording because as long as I know that if I have a negative exponent, it jumps to the other side of a fraction bar and becomes positive, that applies to every single negative exponent that we have. So on number five, there's a couple of ways to do this. Now, if you go the way that most books are going to tell you, um, where you do the reciprocal thing, you would have to split this up as two separate pieces. And if you remember last time I actually did do it that way, you would change it to a seven and then a one over four to the negative five. And of course I'm, I'm banned, I'm gonna do it both ways. So, you know, bear with me for a second. At this point, you would clean up this part and we know that that four to the negative five would come up to the top and become a positive. So we end up with seven times four to the fifth, which is not an attractive answer. If I throw that four to the fifth in my calculator real quick, I end up with 1,024. And if I multiply that by seven, I get 7,168. So the tricky part about these is that instead of having it where there's a one in the numerator or one in the, the numerator once we clean it up or anything, we actually have something else there. And this is basically its own piece, that seven. Now, the way I like to understand these, this is, this is a different method. I'm gonna kinda, gonna kinda do it that way. It mainly works if you're watching it. I don't really have a good way of, of writing it, but it's purely just going off of the idea that we know that if you have a negative exponent, it jumps to the other side of a fraction bar and becomes positive. If you have multiple terms, they all kind of multiply like we like, you know, everything else does when we're pulling things out of roots, they multiply. Um, when we're factoring things out, they multiply. So these things are intrinsically stuck together. So when I clean this up, all I would end up doing is I would take this four to the negative fifth and I would bring it up to the top and make it a four to the positive fifth. Now you might say, hey, that didn't really clean up a whole lot but it might work a little bit better for you conceptually. Um, this works a little better for me in my head. Um, and in fact, that's one way I can do number six as well. So we've already done number five. 
We ended up with 71.68. Let's look at number six. <clears throat> so number six, we have a number, uh, our base to a power over the same base to a different power. So just like say number two or number one, you would follow through and say, okay, well, we have, we're gonna have the same base, but we're going to do the top power minus the bottom power. So we end up with negative nine minus a negative 12. And notice how I do that with the parentheses. I wanna make sure that I'm very carefully subtracting that negative number down there. That is the biggest mistake I, have, I always see from everybody here. I have been guilty of it many, many times in the past. I see people drop one of these negatives because they see that you're subtracting this and I'll just see minus nine minus 12. But since you're taking away a negative, when you have a minus minus, that ends up becoming a plus. Like so. And then at that point, Negative nine plus 12, that's just a three, right? And three cubed, 27. Perfect cube. Do we have any questions on any of these before we look at last week's scientific notation? Feeling marginally okay? Okay. So last week we also did some scientific notation. I have a couple of slides on that because I don't expect you guys to remember that too horribly well. Um, it is tricky. So I did kind of a more lengthy recap on this than I did the last stuff. So scientific notation is always written in two parts, if you remember. So you have just the regular digits with the decimal point is always placed after the first digit. And then it's always times 10 to a power. Um, that essentially puts the decimal point where it should be. So it shows you how many places to move the decimal point left or right. Um, so this largely just helps you represent very large or very small numbers a lot faster. Um, you don't have to write, you know, a couple billion billion by putting zeros and counting them out forever. You can just write times 10 to a power and you're good. It's a little nicer that way. So figure out the power of 10, you think how many places do I move the decimal point? So when the 10 uh, number is 10 or greater, the decimal point has to move to the left, which makes the power of 10 positive. And if you're converting back to decimal, you just kind of undo that. So it moves to the right when you're going back to decimal. Uh, with smaller numbers, it goes, it's the other way around. When the number is smaller than one, the decimal point has to move to the right to make it, you know, to, to reach that, those first decimals or first digits. So the power of 10 ends up being a negative. To convert back to decimal with small numbers, it just moves it back to the left. And of course, that explanation has always just felt like a blender in my head. It's like, oh, left in this case, right in this case, left in this case, right in this case. It's always been very, very dizzying to me. So that's why I just kind of like to remember how, uh, which direction it's gonna move if it's large or small. Take, this one, for example, if I look at that top line, ignoring the paragraph under it, I could see that my decimal point's gonna have to move to the right. And since it has to move to the right, that's where my, I know my power is gonna be a negative. So anytime I have a really tiny number, we end up with a negative power. Anytime I have a really large number, we end up with a positive power. So in this particular case, in scientific notation, the initial part of this number has to be 4.36. You always have one digit point, the rest of your digits that matter. 
So you count how many places the decimal point has to move to get from where it is now to where it needs to be. So you just kind of count out three, six, since I'm doing this with a, high, uh, with a highlighting tool, I'm just gonna do it that way. Nine, 10, and 11. So it has to move 11 places to the right. So because of that, you end up with a times 10 to the negative 11 on this guy. And that'll tell you that 4.36 times 10 to the negative 11th, that is a very small number, the bunch of digits in front of it. And that's, that's really all you need. It's not too bad. And if you're going the other way around, like this next example, convert 4.2 times 10 to the negative 7 to decimal. You look at the exponent on the 10 and you say, okay, well, that's a negative. So because it's a negative, we know it's a very small number. Uh, since the exponent is a seven, you actually have to move the decimal point seven places to the left. And at this point, you might say, how do I know if it's left or to the right? Well, because it's small. If I have a negative power right here, that means this guy is small. And am I going to go to the left or go to the right if it's small? Well, look at it. If I had to actually move it anywhere to make it a tiny number, it's going to have to go to the left. There's no way around that. So that's just kind of how I, I reason through it. Cool. Are we ready for some examples on this? I like taking silences. Yes, Ben, we're excited. We love doing this. The favorite thing in the world. Okay, so this is going to be scientific notation examples. Write that up top. Oh my God, that is not what I wanted to happen. There we go. Okay. So for number one, we're converting two scientific notation for the first several. I have seven, zero, three, one, and then seven zeros. I could try to name that something by saying, oh yeah, it's, uh, it's million, so it's 70 billion. I'm just gonna remember how many zeros there are, I'm not gonna lie. Okay. So if we're converting this from sci uh, to scientific notation, the first thing to do is determine where our decimal point is. Well, this is, a, this is a solid number, it's an integer, which means that our decimal point is hanging out right there. So in order to figure out what power we're gonna need on our times 10, we just take that decimal point from there and go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10, because of course we want that decimal point after our first digit here, right? So we'll have 7.031, so it's all the digits that matter here, right? Times 10 to the, how many times did I move, 10? That's gonna be a positive 10 because this is a large number. We move to the left, that's where we get that 10. And our second one, 12400, okay. So that's our second guy. And it follows the same steps. First, you determine where your decimal is. Well, we have an integer. So again, it's gonna be kind of right over there. See how many times you move it. That ended up being five. And you're gonna have the decimals that matter, the, the digits that matter. So no trailing zeros. 
times 10 to whatever power you just got by moving that. Remember all that times 10 is doing is if I multiplied this number by 10, I would get 12. If I multiplied by another 10, I'd get 120. Another 1204, another I'd get 12,040, another and I would be right where we started, which is exactly what you're doing. All you're doing is you're figuring out how many tens to essentially chop off of this guy to make it make it neater. Okay. Looking at number three, we have 0 0.0000321. Cool, all right, all right, not bad. So find our decimal right there, figure out how many places we need to move. One, two, three, four, so right there. And we move to the right, this is a small number, so we know we're gonna have times 10 to an, oh my God, I don't know what's happening there. I made my 10 an exponent. We know we're gonna have times 10 to a negative exponent. What are we gonna have? We're gonna have 3.21 times 10 to the negative one, two, three, four. Okay. Number four, I have 0 0.0041002. That's a zero, I promise. It's one of the ugliest zeros I've ever done, but it's kind of looking at me funny. So we take the decimal point, move it to where it needs to go. One, two, three, right there. Now, in this case, even though I have a bunch of zeros in between, we still have this two, which means that our scientific notation is going to need to go all the way out to that two. So in this particular case, scientific notation isn't really chopping down on the amount of work we're having to do on writing this just because we end up with so many digits here. That does happen. Um, but usually it's going to be a smaller number or a larger number than this to kind of justify that. So it's always going to be times 10. Question is what power? We went back one, two, three times. So it's going to be a negative three since we went to the right. Okay. Now five and six are going to be going the other way around. They're going to be converting to decimal. Number five is 1.421 times 10 to the ninth. And I'm going to go ahead and write number six down right now as well. 6.284 times 10 to the negative fourth. So in this case, all we really need to do, you write down the digits that we got. Don't worry about the decimal point right now. Because what we're going to do is we're going to go out nine times. Now, since this is 10 to the ninth, 10 to the ninth is a large number, which means this is gonna end up being a large number. So that decimal is gonna to have to go to the right to make this a large number. So start with where we are now and start counting. One, two, three. And then even though I don't have anything after that, 
four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So you just count out however many times you got to move. And then in every one of these dips where we didn't have anything, that's where those zeros are going to be. You're kind of filling in what the scientific notation chopped off. And I'll rewrite that. So we had six zeros, one, two, three, four, five, six. And you can do the commas every third if you want to. I don't often do that, but with scientific notation, it kind of makes whatever I'm ending with or, or beginning with easier to look at, in my opinion, easier to understand rather than just being a giant mess of digits. So a lot of times I'll do it this way. So we have 1,421,000,000, and there we go. Yay. Okay. Same thing happens over here on number six. We have 6284. Okay. Now this is times 10 to the negative four, which means this is a small number. And if it's a small number, that means our digit's going to have to go to the left to make this a small number. So we're going to start with where it was and go one, two, three, four. Again, put zeros on all those little dips. Well, zero point zero 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 six two eight four. And again, this zero became into existence by the fact that our decimal point was there and we wanted something to the left of it. So you can't just technically have a point something, you have to have something point something. That's why a lot of times you'll see it written that way. Either way, these digits over here are exactly what we ended up with. Okay. Not much more now. I just have a couple where we're fixing the scientific notation. Oops. Started writing too many zeros. I have the temptation to change the slide instead of erasing ink, but you know. Feel like that would be a little ridiculous. But if I encapsulate any concept, it's ridiculousness. All right. <clears throat> so in these cases, so number seven and number eight, they're already scientific notation, but they're not proper scientific notation. Because as we've gone over a few times, every time we do scientific notation, it's have one digit, the decimal point, the rest of our digits times 10 to a power. And that's something that we've kept through on every single one of these. Number five and number six gave us two in scientific notation. They were already correct. These two are not. Because we need to have one digit point the rest of our digits. In this case, we have three to the left of our decimal point. So this decimal point actually needs to come over two more. So what we end up having to do is we end up having to adjust this six. Now, for a lot of people, including myself, that's kind of confusing. I, I don't like fixing these. Um, since it's moving to the left, it actually will add two to this. But if you're ever confused and you're like, oh God, I'm in a test. I don't remember which direction he said, this is a nightmare, try mentally, try mentally just kind of doing something like this, where it's like, oh yeah, if I'm taking this out of scientific notation, I would have six digits here, but I know I need to be right here, right? So what would that be? Well, that would be 
those six plus another two. So either way you look at it, you end up adding two to this power. If you can understand that us moving this way just adds two over here, absolutely, that's great, do this. If you can't, just kind of mentally pull it out of the scientific notation and then back in so you can kind of see it shifting. And I'll do that one more time over here. It's the same sort of thing happens, right? We have 0 0.0312 times 10 to the negative fifth. Okay, well, we know that decimal needs to be right here. So this one's also going to move over by two. Is this going to go up to, or is it going to go down to? Well, over here, when it went to the left twice, it went up to, right? So it would stand a reason if over here, we're going to the right two, it would likely do the opposite direction. Going left added, going right, most likely subtracts. So this one's going to end up being times 10 to the negative seventh. It would help if I actually wrote this correctly. End up with 3.12 times 10 to the negative seventh. And again, if you don't understand it, you can very well just picture yourself pulling it out of scientific notation and then putting it right back in. And you can see that it would pick up two more times that that decimal place is kind of being pushed in this direction. So that's just a way that I tend to visualize it in my head in order to make sure I don't end up going the wrong direction on this. If you understand the concept of these, it shouldn't be too much of a nightmare. Worst case scenario, you can you could very well just do it the long way and put it back into decimal and then put it back into scientific notation. That does sound like a nightmare um and largely unnecessary and if i was going to make a test to confuse you guys i would probably add a zero right here because then it would be prohibitively ugly to do that way and it would help for you guys to understand it to be able to do this so that's something to watch out for so again you moved left he added two you move right, you subtract it too. That should, that concept should apply to every single one of these where you're fixing the scientific notation or just putting it into scientific notation. It's technically doing the same thing. Okay, any questions on basics of scientific notation? So at least for our review, I have a few more problems before we get into the new stuff. Because last time we also did dividing and multiplying scientific notation. That would be these guys. And they both kind of follow the same concept. Makes your life a little bit easier. Uh, they take advantage of the commutative property of multiplication. So if you have a bunch of things multiplied together, it'll make your life a little bit better if you pick out the things that multiply nicely together and then multiply those, those particular products together at the end of it. So what you could see there from our first example on there, the 2.3 times 10 to the fifth and the 9.2 times 10 to the negative 13th. Uh, the easy way to work this out is to group them differently. You have 2.3 and 9.2 that go together nicely. And then the, the tens to a power go together very nicely, right? So you would look at this and you'd say, okay, well, 
If I multiply these two guys together, I end up with 21.16, which isn't proper scientific notation, but don't worry about it. You can fix it later. The main thing to do on, on first steps for these is to clean it up. And then the next part, you have 10 to the fifth times 10 to the negative 13th. Nice enough, you can add those powers. So we just end up with times 10 to the negative eight. So if you split it up this way, you can see that this is your first part of scientific notation. This is your second part of scientific notation. And it cleans up quite nicely. It's just sometimes you're not in proper scientific notation. So this is a situation where you would have to fix where that decimal is. So you're gonna adjust it to fit the standard form. So that decimal point right there needs to come one back to the left. And since it's moving to the left, you add one to the power. So we end up with 2.116 times 10 to the negative seventh. So you end up adding the one to the negative eight, you end up with a negative seven and we're peachy. Now with division, it follows the exact same concept, except where here we were multiplying, down here we're dividing. I use the same exact answer or numbers to use as an example. So if I was taking that first guy and dividing by the second one, you would easy enough split it up about the same way. You have 2.3 divided by 9.2, and then that's going to be multiplied by the other quotient. So you have 10 to the fifth over 10 to the negative 13th. 2.3 divided by 9.2 ends up being 0.25. 10 to the fifth over 10 to the negative 13th. Remember, if you're subtracting a negative, you end up changing it to a positive. So we end up with five plus 13, we get the 18th power. And then in this particular case, we are again, not in standard notation. So we need to move that decimal point one to the right. Since we moved it one to the right, our number goes down right here by one. So we end up with 2.5 times 10 to the 17th, which would be really awkward to write out in decimal. Just absolutely awkward to write out in decimal. I, didn't, I would never want to deal with that. Okay. So of course, I have a bunch of examples. I don't know how well they're going to work out. I literally just mashed my keyboard. That's how these numbers came about. You can kind of tell. I mean, no, I, I, I worked very hard on these. All right. So for number one, I have 1.46 times 10 to the sixth. times 8.2 times 10 to the negative third. Jumping over to the visualizer, there's our problem. So again, I have a bunch of stuff multiplied together, multiplied by a bunch of stuff multiplied together, which means that's that's when we can get away with using our commutative property, right? Because nothing other than multiplication is happening here. So we can rearrange them. I would prefer to have the 1.46 multiplied onto the 8.2. And then we can have the 10 to the powers together. So we have something like that. You might personally write it with the little X's for the multiplication symbol, which you notice I always have, even though I avoid doing that, I always have it on scientific notation because that is the proper way of writing that. So it just, it just has that. Uh, so if I multiply these guys together, 1.46 times 8.2, we end up with 11, 0.972. Then we'll have our times 10 to the power. We just got to figure it out from these guys. We have a 10 to the sixth and the 10 to the negative third. 
which means we can add these powers together since the bases are multiplied together. Six minus three would be a three. There we are. Now, this one, you would want to fix the scientific notation. That decimal needs to come over once, right? So this would end up, remember I'm moving to the left, so I would add one to the power. I would end up with 1.1972 times 10 to the fourth. And you might notice that there's, there's really no good reason to keep this problem in scientific notation because this is 10 to the fourth. Well, how many digits do I have after that decimal? Four. So what's gonna happen if I pull this thing out of scientific notation? That decimal is just gonna go four to the right to cancel out this four. And I end up with 11,972. If sometimes you're asked specifically to write it in scientific notation, in times like those, this would be the right way to do things. If you're working on your own numbers or something in the real world and you end up with something where you're, you're multiplying very large and very small numbers together, which is how we got something in the middle, something that wasn't horrible. We had a very small, large number and a very small number. So it kind of evened out. Um, this is also an acceptable answer because there's no point in having this thing in scientific notation if all of the digits are already, already on the paper. There's just no point to having it in scientific notation. Number two is gonna be very similar. We end up with 6.04 times 10 to the negative fifth multiplied on to 3.56 times 10 to the third. I don't know why I closed my parentheses early. I'm a little out of it at the moment. I know I always am for one reason or another, but I mean, hey. So we're gonna end up doing this exactly the same way as the last one. We're gonna have the 6.04 multiplied by 3.56. And then those are going to be multiplied by our 10 to the powers. And I'm just going to kind of write those in order that we have them. So 10 to the negative fifth and 10 to the third. Okay. All right. So you multiply these two together, and I end up with 21. 0.5024. I would have my times 10 to the power. And the question is what power, right? So we end up adding these powers together, negative five plus a three, we'd end up with a negative two. Okay, and then we would need to fix this scientific notation. So this decimal point is going to move over by one. It was not my intention to have two problems that had no point being in scientific notation in a row. Since I am moving it to the left, we add one to the power. Negative two becomes a negative one. And again, if you have something like this, that means that all your relevant numbers are already on your paper. So you can just convert this back to decimal if you'd like by moving that over to the one and you would have 0 0.215024 as your decimal answer. So you can see it in scientific notation Well, that's weird. You can kind of see why my pen isn't writing too well. It's got like a little jump in it. <laughs> my pen just dotted itself. Um, 
So you can, uh, this is the scientific notation form. This is what I was trying to get you guys to understand. But based on what we ended up with, you can just convert it back to a decimal and this is a perfectly acceptable answer as well. Okay. More examples, more examples. So now we have scientific notation with division. So I have 2.31 times 10 to the fourth over, I'm just gonna write it this way, 2.43 times 10 to the seventh. All right, all right. <clears throat> it's actually going to work out really nicely. So if you remember from the slides, these ones, since they were multiplication, you just multiply the numbers together and add the powers. So it would make sense that if we're dividing, you would divide these numbers together and subtract the powers. Same sort of concept, different direction, right? So I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna write this out just on this particular number, just so you guys can kind of see what's happening there. Essentially what we're doing is we're splitting it. We're splitting it to do it with these guys together and then these guys together. You don't have to write it this way. If it makes it make more sense for you, that's fine while you're learning it. Perfectly fine to do it that way, but it's absolutely not necessary. You could very well just look at this and say, oh, that divided by that. So we end up with 2.31 divided by 2.43. End up with 0. Point, and we get a bunch of things. I'm going to just round to the third decimal place. When in doubt and you got a round, third decimal place is usually where things round. It also happens to be the most scientifically accurate thing for reasons that I am not going to go into. If you're ever really curious about math, you can look up a lesson on significant figures. It's literally the only thing that stuck in my head from my physics class. Nothing else did. It's all gone, all of it. Okay. And it's gonna be times 10 to a power. Our power is of course the top power minus the bottom power. Four minus seven, we end up with a negative three. Now, this isn't in proper no scientific notation, just like honestly, when you're multiplying and dividing these guys, you'll notice it's almost never already in proper scientific notation. So this decimal point has to move one to the right, which means it's getting pushed further in the negatives. We end up with 9.51 times 10 to the negative fourth. Okay. Any questions on that guy? Comments, concerns, freaking out. Freaking out's acceptable too. You're gonna start flailing. I will listen and help and empathize with your flailing. God knows I've flailed enough in this stuff. Everybody tends to hate math, but I stuck with it. Fun story, I actually failed college algebra once. Just absolutely failed. Just knocked it out of the park with the, park with the level of failure I had. Absolutely failed it. Took away all my financial aid, scholarships, all of it. Really sucked. Lit a fire under my butt, got them back. Did I get an A the next semester? No, I got a B. But you know what? I was cool with that B. That B was progress. 
And I got an A on every math class ever since because from day one, I just stuck with it. It all builds on each other. I mean, all of this is building on each other. We've done, we've done long division. We've done long division with decimal places. We've done exponents. We've done exponents with subtraction. It all is building into this one type of problem. It gets messier as you go along, but as long as you stick with it and you don't, don't let yourself fall too far behind, you can usually pull yourself out of a hole. So in this particular problem, I'm not gonna write it like I did before where, I'm, where I split it up. It's unnecessary. I can just say, oh, I'm gonna do this divided by that. So 8.738 divided by 1.2. I end up with this big ugly thing. Which again, I'm going to round to the third decimal place. 7.282. I'm just sticking with how many decimal places I had up there. And we're gonna have times 10 to a power. Our power is going to be this guy minus that guy. Now be careful, again, we are subtracting a negative number. So if I do 12 minus a negative five, I'm gonna write it off to the side. We end up adding. So we end up with a 17. Hey, look, this one actually did end up being in scientific notation. We have one digit, period, the rest of our digits. Completely unintentional, that just worked out. But that would be how we'd want to set that up. So without intervention, that's my last scientific notation problem of the night. Does anyone have any questions on them? If you have any dumb questions, throw them at me. Everybody else is thinking the same thing. If not, we can move on. Going once, going twice. Sold to learning a new concept. Cool. So, moving on a little bit. Units of measurement. So an easy way to consider a unit is that it's any measurement that there's one of. A unit could be a second, kilometer, mile, meter, gallon, etc. And then you can have different sets of units. Um, there are sets of units for length, capacity, weight, time. Usually you have different, you know, you'll have different units for different things, and then you kind of group them together. So you will have a group where there's length, a group where there's capacity, a group where there's weight. Um, so you, when you do group different units together, that's actually considered a system of units. So we have two major systems of measurement that we look at. Uh, the American system, it's just also known, there's so many names for it, it's ridiculous. I don't think it was ever properly named. Um, so you have the American system, which is also known as the US customary system. Um, you might see it as standard system. Um, and then my personal favorite to work with is the metric system, because with the US American standard system, uh, you have to remember all these different little things. And with metric, you just like, it's kind of like scientific notation. You're just moving over by 10. It's kind of great. It's kind of convenient. The only people that deal with metric in this country are scientists and drug dealers. They seem to be onto something. They're also on something, but they seem to be onto something. <laughs> I made myself chuckle. All right. So for the most part, the next many slides are going to cover largely just different vocabs. Um, the metric slides are going to feel a little 
little overdone because they all for, they all they all convert the same way. Um, but the US ones are, are funky, as you might know. And for most part, you end up having only about three or four units per. So in this case, we're going to take a look at length first. So with American units of measurement, we have length. Uh, so there's inches, feet, yards, miles, et cetera. You can kind of kind of play with there's there's more from there, but I mean, these are the main ones you're going to end up using, right? And for the most part, since we've been dealing with these all our lives, we, we, we know quite a bit of them. We know that one foot is 12 inches. We know that a yard is three feet, which happens to make it 36 inches. And one mile, which probably doesn't stick in all your heads, is 5,280 feet. Now, one thing I do want to cover is when you do go to take the high set or the GED, um, whether you do it online or in person, they usually give you a little formula sheet. These types of conversions right here, knowing what they are, will be on that sheet. Um, and actually as a random aside, let me jump into one of my many downloads. Did I put it in here? Did I put it in here? I did not put it in here. Did I put it in here? I sure did. So this in particular is the formula sheet that I got off of the official HiSET math uh, website. Uh, this is something where if you take a written test or an online test, these formulas are all supplied to you, every single one. So you don't have to freak out too much about it. Um, now you'll notice we haven't really played around with the stuff on the at the end. That might be that might be our last class. We might get there. We might not. I don't know. This was the foundations class for a reason. These are funky. Uh, but you'll notice that on the right, it is all units, every single one of them. A foot is 12 inches, yard three feet. We got yards, we got meters. And notice that it's split by length, capacity, weight. Um, and at the very bottom where there's kind of a gap, that's something we're not going to be covering tonight. That's going to be something for converting between the metric and the standard unit systems. And that's something that will come a little bit later. Um, I did not prepare that at all for tonight. And honestly, it would make your brains explode if we did it tonight. I know that I did that to my last class and I ended up with at 1.7 fractions multiplied together to convert one thing to another thing and everybody's heads popped. So I'm going to avoid that. But for the most part, what we're going to be covering tonight is everything here other than where the, the kind of gap jumps. So for the most part, we're just going to be playing with well, what, what units do we have? What are we looking at? We already know length. Uh, we have weight. Uh, this is where it starts getting shakier for me. One pound is 16 ounces. I don't often measure things in ounces unless we're dealing with food, you know? Yeah, that's literally the only... Like, what else do you measure in ounces? I don't know, babies? You measure babies in ounces. We better food and babies in ounces, and that's kind of a weird comparison. Huh? It's just yeah, food and babies, which are some re for some reason on the same level right now. <laughs> Let's not read into that. Uh, so one ton is 2,000 pounds. And if you kind of think about it, you could also convert directly from ounces to, uh, from tons to, to ounces, because you could look at that and say, well, if I know that one pound is 16 ounces, then one ton would be 2,000 times 16 ounces, right? So it'd be like 32,000 ounces, which would be a big baby. We also have capacities. These are my least favorite of any of them, even though most of them come very, very easily. 
So with uh, capacity, usually you think of uh, things in fluids because uh, it's, it's a volumetric type of unit system. Uh, so you'll have fluid ounces, cups, pints, quarts, and gallons. Um, you'll see that in parentheses, I have abbreviated what they usually are abbreviated to. I almost never write a C for a cup. I've never actually seen it written that way, but where I uh, found all these units, I had a C there and I was like, apparently that's what it's, what it's done with. I would just write cup, but you know, that's me. So one cup is eight fluid ounces, a pint is two cups, a quart is two pints, and a gallon is four quarts. That's the only one of these that actually makes a reasonable amount of sense to me because a quart means a quarter. A quart is a quarter gallon. So how many quarts do we have in a gallon? Four of them. Everything else, it's weird. Honestly, who thought this up? This is an awful system. I hate this one. Who doesn't hate this one? And you can go further. We can go with teaspoons and tablespoons. Those have different units as well. They're not just pretty spoons. They actually have, have a specific volume in them. So let's actually work on some of these. Oh, hey, look, I did actually have some memes. Oh, that's right, because I actually prepared this for a week ago. So these are going to be all of our American unit examples. I'm going to write them down real quick. Okay, so I wrote down the first three so far. So these actually aren't bad, um, but you do essentially need to embrace fractions for these, which is why I went over fractions for so long. Um, in order to clean these up, you end up using, um, Remember when we went over unit rate, uh, where you we were figuring out, oh, well, this is the cost per one ounce or, or et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's basically what you're doing here. If I say that one foot is 12 inches, that in itself is essentially a little unit conversion. That's what we're going to end up doing here is we're going to be doing unit conversions. So what you can do is you write out what you're starting with, 25 feet, and then we say, okay, well, we're moving towards yards. Well, we know what, how many feet are in a yard or how many, yeah, how many feet are in a yard? Three. So what you end up doing is you end up multiplying it by a fraction. And on that fraction, the top and the bottom have to equal the same thing. Now, generally, Your units, whatever you have right now, you're in feet, that's going to be on the bottom. That's what you're going to multiply off. That's going to cancel out. What you're going to is going to be up top. So the way I tend to do these is I usually set up those units first, and then I say, OK, well, what is this? Well, I know that one yard is three feet. OK, so what we end up doing, look at our numbers here. We end up doing 25 times one third. Now, here's an interesting thing. Um, units actually cancel out the same way that factors do. If I have feet divided by feet, it actually cancels. So if I look at this as this 25 being over one, which we can do, right? This feet and this feet are actually gonna cancel out, okay? So what ends up happening is if I multiply straight through, I can multiply across on top, 25 times one, 
across on the bottom, one times three. I'm now gonna be in yards. I'm not gonna be happy about it, right? Just throw that at a calculator. You should get something around 8.33 yards. Now the same sort of thing happens on number two, except we have no idea how many yards are in a mile, right? We know how many feet are in a yard, and we know how many feet are in a mile. And if you don't know it off the top of your head, don't worry, I'm gonna write it down. So what you wanna do on this one, 5790 yards, we're gonna actually convert this guy to feet. I'm gonna say convert to feet. So we're gonna do the same thing we did up here, except it's gonna be kind of flipped around. I'm gonna have three feet over one yard because that way our yards cancel out. And we end up with 17,370 feet. But we're not done yet. We were aiming for miles. So this is where we're going to want to convert to miles. And we know we have a conversion unit for going from feet to miles. It ends up being one mile is 5,280 feet. And these end up being multiplied together. I kind of crammed them a little too close together, my bad. So I have 17,370 times one over 5,280. Kind of like what happened over here where the yards canceled out, the same thing's going to happen with our feet right here. Feet's gonna cancel. The only unit I'm gonna be left with is miles, right? And to make multiplying these two things together easier, I'm gonna put that over one so I can see that, oh yeah, I'm gonna have one times that. So I'm gonna have 17,370 over 5,280 miles. Now, obviously that's not a nice answer. I'm gonna throw it at my calculator. But before I do, if I have a zero on the end and a zero over a zero on the end, I can cancel those zeros out. Because hey, what's 10 divided by 10? It's gone, it's one. So I'm gonna just put 1737 over 528 in my calculator. I end up with that weird looking thing. I'm just gonna round it to the to probably the third digit. So if I'm rounding to the third digit, I look at the next digit, which is an eight. And I say, okay, that's gonna to have to round up. So it's gonna be 3.271 miles. Nice and pretty. Everybody's, everybody's happy with that. That was a two-stepper. Should see what happens where we're going from miles per hour to meter per second. Those are fun. Might as well turn this paper sideways so you have more, more writing room. And then for number three, we have 313 tons to pounds. Well, that's not too bad, right? Is if you remember on that slide earlier, we had that um, a ton was 2,000 pounds, right? So I have 313 tons. I'm going to multiply that by a fraction. And I know I'm going to have tons and pounds. Tons, pounds. So I know one ton is 2,000 pounds. And 
I'm going to cancel out the units tons. So I know that I'm now in just pounds. On the bottom, I just have a one. So I'm not really going to have to worry about multiplying that, right? I'm just going to multiply these guys on top. 313 times 2,000 pounds. Well, 313 times two is easy, right? That would be six, a two, and a six. And then I have three zeros on this guy over here. And that is the cheapest multiplication you'll ever see in your life. That's going to be LBS for pounds. So 626,000 pounds. More than a little bit. Okay. What else we got? It's number four. I have five tons, two ounces. Why did I think that was a good idea? Okay, well, we don't have anything to go from tons to ounces, right? But I kind of, when we were going over that, I said that we could easily convert, uh, see how many ounces were in a ton by just doing the multiplication. We could do that same thing again. So this one's gonna be another two step. We're gonna go from tons to pounds because on our conversions, we only had pounds to ounces. We can't go straight from tons to ounces. So we're gonna go from tons to pounds exactly like we did on the last problem, times 2,000 pounds over one ton. The tons would cancel and we would get 10,000 pounds where we are now. I'm going to write over to here. This is tons to pounds. And we're going to do from pounds to ounces. And our, on our conversion, we have one pound is 16 ounces. So if I have 10,000 pounds, and I'm converting that to ounces. One pound is 16 ounces. Our pounds would cancel. We have 16 times 10,000. So we have 16 with that many zeros on the ends. OZ for ounces. So sometimes you kind of got to go a couple of steps to get there. So the ton, tons to ounces, we just took one step down to pounds, and then we took another step down to ounces. So we just slowly move down our list of, of units. Okay. Do a few more. Huh. I actually did number five just now. You know what? We're gonna be cheap about it. Cough. There we go. I didn't just change the slideshow to make sure that I didn't make a, make a mistake at all. I don't know what you're talking about. So three miles, two inches. Well, that sounds fun. So in a problem like this, just kind of like the last couple, you can't go straight from miles to inches, but we know we can go from miles to feet and then from feet, we can go to inches. So that's what we're gonna do first. We're gonna do miles 
two feet. So I know I have three miles. I'm gonna multiply that. by however many feet are in a mile. So I have 5,280 feet in one mile. Oh, we have ink on the side of my hand. Yep, there we go. Cool, that's cool. Good stuff. So the miles cancel, just like all the other problems we've done. We have three times 5,280. I absolutely, I could do it in my head. 15,000, 15,860 maybe? I don't know. 5,280 times three. Ooh, that was so close. 15,840. 15,840 feet. Now we want to go from feet two inches. Okay. So I'm going to have exactly what we just had. I'm going to multiply that. Oh, I'm going to write my units first. Feet multiplied on two. That way I can see, oh, well, if I got feet up here to cancel it, I need feet down here. So I'd have inches up here. I'm gonna have 12 inches in one foot. So the feet would cancel. Whatever I have is gonna be in inches now. 15,840 times 12. So I have 190,080. So 190080 inches. So if you ever hate somebody, you can you can get up, think of a reason like, oh man, you gotta make this up to me. Go count. 190,000 inches in the road from here. And I know exactly where it is. And you call me and tell me when you found it. And that's how you make it up to me. You just make a guy walk down the road and count out three miles, one foot at a time. Or 10 feet at a time. Really, it just depends on how long your measuring tape is. Give him a ruler. All right. So I have a couple of more. So I have 12 gallons to quartz. Okay. Well, I, I, I mentioned this is my favorite one, right? Because I know how many quarts are in a gallon because quart means quarter. So if I have 12 gallons, and I needed to do a conversion on it, I'd have gallons on the bottom and quarts on the bottom, uh, on the top. And I know one gallon is four quarts. My gallons would cancel out. I end up with 48 quarts. So that one's not bad, huh? That one's okay. Now we have one left. It is three pints to fluid ounces. The fluid ounces are different from ounces because you know that needed to be confusing. So if we look at our old slide, we know that one pint is two cups 
and one cup is eight fluid ounces. So these are going to be the conversions that we're gonna to use to get there. Okay, so you can see that we'll, we'll be able to go from pints to cups and then from cups to fluid ounces. We're gonna do that first. We're gonna do pints to cups. So I have three pints multiplied by, we have pints on the bottom, so cups on the top. And for every one pint, it's two cups. Pints cancels out. Three times two is six cups. And then we can do cups to fluid ounces. So we're starting with six cups. We're going to fluid ounces. So we know one cup is eight fluid ounces. Cups cancel. Six times eight, 48 fluid ounces. Any questions on these? So I wanna do one last random example. It's gonna be a little bit more advanced. But what I'm actually going to do is I'm gonna do that same problem we did a little while ago, three miles, two inches. But what if we wanted to do this all at once, right? Because if you remember, we went from miles to feet and then feet to inches. Now, as you get further along in these types of problems, and I actually don't plan on building a lesson around doing this. This is a more advanced application of it, but it does come up in the future. Otherwise, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know it. It can't, you can say, oh, well, I'm going from, from miles to feet, exactly like we did before. But instead of having an equal sign, I can simply say, oh, well, I can cancel these miles out. And I know that I'm in feet now. And if I know that I'm in feet, I can go from those feet to inches by multiplying on this guy as well. And now I could cancel out those feet. And the only units I have left are inches. So you would be able to multiply across on top and across on bottom. And granted, on the bottom, we just have one, so it's not a big deal. But you'd be able to multiply those straight across and get our 190,080 inches. You can absolutely do that. You can use both of them at the same time. By doing it as two steps, we're making our lives a little bit easier. We're breaking it into smaller chunks, but we very well could have just taken where we were right here on number seven. We could have taken that and slap this piece right here onto the back of it. And we would have had the same answer. And as you get further along, that's something you end up doing and it moves from something called, it moves from just calling it unit measurements to the more proper term, which is dimensional analysis because you're analyzing the dimensions of something. So fancy word for unit conversion, but that's just as an example.
Cool. All right. So we got a ways to go. I have been talking for an hour and a half straight. I think it's a good time for a break. So we're going to have a 10 minute break and return at 740. We, I just, yep. If you have any questions, I will still be here. Otherwise, use the restroom and do as you will for the next 10 minutes before I start talking about time. I already. All right. Everybody refreshed in their excitement for math? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, we got more stuff, as we know. This one we're all pretty familiar with. We have units of measurement at our time. We're used to time. A minute is 60 seconds, an hour is 60 minutes, and a day is 24 hours. Obviously, you can keep going from there. A week is seven days, a year is 365, et cetera. So you can kind of keep playing with it. Okay. So we'll just jump straight into the actual examples here. This one's kind of a kind of a quick one. If you have an hour and 35 minutes, how many minutes is that? Well, I wanted to do it this way because it's kind of like um, kind of like when we have mixed fractions, this is mixed units, right? We have one type of unit and another type of unit. We don't often think of it that way, but that's what's happening, right? So if you want to look at it, we could really just kind of split this up. This is one hour plus 35 minutes. And if we do it that way, we can easily just worry about this piece right here. Now we've done, uh, we've, we've played with time for our entire lives. So we know how many minutes this is. We can convert that straight away into 60 minutes. Plus 35 minutes. And now these have the same type of same type of unit, which means we can put them together. We'll end up with 95 minutes. So it kind of, if you look at it that way, just splitting it up like that kind of still follows the whole mixed fraction, break things apart sort of thing that we've done before. So it all kinds of kind of boils down together. Now, number two, we're converting eight hours into seconds. That's a little messier, right? So it was me writing it. So we're converting from eight hours to seconds. We can do that in two pieces. We can do hours to minutes, and then we can go from minutes to seconds, right? Let's worry about hours to minutes first. We're gonna work this out the same way we did the last group of problems. We have eight hours, we're gonna convert that into minutes first. We know that one hour is 60 minutes. And our hours would cancel just like they did before on different types of units, like you know, cups and quarts and what have you. And you just multiply across. Eight times 60, well, eight times six is 48. And if I'm multiplying it by 60, that means I have an extra zero on there. So I have 480 minutes. Okay. 
So we got eight hours converted into minutes. Now we need to go from here to seconds. 480 minutes. We're going to multiply that by a fraction again. We're going to go from minutes to seconds. And we know that one minute has 60 seconds. So I'm going to end up multiplying 480 times 60 because the minutes cancel out like they always do. That one I can't do off the top of my head. So I have 2,880 with another zero from that 60. So 28,800 seconds. So, you know, if you're ever trying to figure out how to scold your kid, you just point them at the corner and say count to 28,800. And if they move any, any sooner than eight hours, uh, then on top of dealing with CPS, you can also tell them that uh, they were wrong. The next one, if you worked, Five days a week, for four hours a day, how many minutes? I'm gonna have to leave class a little early. I have to go to the store. Okay, no problem. See you next time. Boy, howdy. I'll make a note of that. Okay. I just unironically said, boy, howdy. Well, I'm still living. No deity has struck me by lightning yet. And that's how you know that I am not the deity because I would have struck myself by lightning for that one. All right. How many minutes is this? How many seconds? I'm getting a little backwards here. I wrote NEMI, now NEMI. How many seconds? Okay. So if we work five days a week for four hours per day, how many minutes do we work in a week? Well, the first idea, uh, first thought is what's our total? Right, we've done this sort of math pretty pretty regularly throughout our lives, right? If we're working five days a week and four hours a day, then you could just do five times four, and that'll be 20 total hours in the week. From there, if you know that that's how much you're gonna work in a week, you can go to minutes, We're going to minutes. So we have 20 hours. That's going to be one hour is 60 minutes. So the hours cancel off. We end up with 20 times 60. Two times six is 12. I got a zero here and a zero here. So I get two zeros here. So I get 1200 minutes. 
Okay, well, that's the first part of our problem. Now, how many seconds? Okay, well, we'll start off with that 1200 minutes. And we'll do the same thing where one minute is 60 seconds. So 60 times 1200, six times 12 is 72. And I have one, two, three zeros on there. So I have 72,000 seconds. And in fact, let's make this a little trickier. Let's make this a little trickier. Let's say that they're given 52 uh, weeks in a year, how many seconds per year? So if you had to figure out how many seconds you work, four hours per day, five days a week, in an entire year, you could figure out how many seconds you work in one week. And then you can take that and multiply it by however many weeks you have. We end up with three, seven, four, four with three zeros on them. That's 3,744,000 seconds in a year. Imagine counting down those seconds at your part-time job annually. And then keep in mind that a full-time job is twice that. And most people can't support themselves on only one full-time job. So, this sucks. That's a, that a number we don't like. That is 20 hours a week in seconds for a year. So, you know, if you hate somebody, <laughs> you can make them count that high. They spend less than four hours a day on it, and you know what's going up. Okay. So that's all we had on examples for time. Now we got different types of measurement. Now we're moving from, because I mean, let's face it, time units aren't hanging out in the, the American standard or the metric standard. They just are. We're not breaking them. We're not telling different time in a different part of the, uh, the, the planet, unless you count daylight savings and time zones, at which point it's all over the place. I've already managed to complicate this. But now we can move into the metric system of measurement. So the metric system is a lot easier to work with. And I say that because it's all based on tens. I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, it's kind of like scientific notation. The whole thing was based on multiplying, dividing by 10. Same sort of thing with the metric system, except not quite as weird looking. So the metric system actually is based completely based on the prefixes that you might have. The smaller units all have a Latin prefix. The larger units have Greek prefixes. So that's why you'll see multiple things that mean 100 and multiple things that mean 1,000 because they kind of went both directions just have just switch between Greek and Latin. Whoever developed this is like, ah, I can't decide on one. Let's just have both. So deci means 10, centi means 100, milli means 1,000, and for large, 
units, you have deca for 10, hecto for 100, and kilo for 1,000. And for the most part, you know, real, real world stuff, for larger units, you're usually just going to end up playing around with kilometers past meters. Um, you're probably not going to end up with decimeters because, I mean, how many times have you heard somebody measure anything in decimeters? You haven't. You never have. But centimeters and millimeters, you have. So reasonably, the first ones we look at are length. So with every type of metric unit, you'll have a basic unit of measurement. With length, the basic unit of measurement is a meter. And you take that unit of measurement and all of those Greek and Latin prefixes on the previous slide, and you slap them together. So the large units, you'll have kilometer, hectometer, and decameter. And those are 1,000 meters, 100 meters, and 10 meters, respectively. For your small units, you'll have decimeters, centimeters, and millimeters. So you can kind of see how it's easily based in 10 based on this slide alone. One decimeter is 0.1 meters, so it's a tenth of a meter. A centimeter is 0 0.01 meters, so it's a hundredth. And a millimeter is 0 0.001 meters, so it's a thousandth. So you can kind of have this, this nice little symmetry. Um, so that's all of the measurement lengths. Then you play around with mass. Um, now, mass is kind of a weird situation because in the, in the standard setup, we have pounds, we have weight. Um, now, with the metric system, it does things a little differently. It's still a measure of, weight is still kind of a measure of mass, but it's actually affected by gravity. You know, it's kind of like how you know you, you weigh differently on Earth as you would on the moon. Um, mass is the amount of matter in an object. Um, so that means that your mass on Earth would be the same as your mass on the moon be the exact same. So in the metric system, that's something that doesn't deal with gravity. In the American system, it does deal with gravity. So it's kind of weird. Um, but because everything we're playing around with has to deal with stuff on Earth, um, you'll end up seeing different formulas for being able to convert them between the two. Because for the most part, you're doing this stuff on the planet. <laughs> so that's just like a little aside past that. That's not really a, something you really have to worry about. Um, I just wanted to put that in there so you understood the difference. Like I say there, they can be used interchangeably as long as our measurements are done on Earth. So the basic unit of weight and the metric system for mass is a gram. We played around with that enough. So large units are kilograms for 1,000, heptagrams for 100, decagrams for 10. And small units are decigrams, so a tenth, centigrams, so a hundredth, and milligrams, which is a thousandth. You can already tell when it comes to these, for the most part, I mean, what have, we, what have we really used in our lives? We've used a hundredth, we've used a thousandth, and we've used a thousand. We've used kilo, we've used centi, and we've used milli. But for the most part, the other three are kind of foreign to us. Decagram is a weird looking word. Makes you think it'd be a strange shape, but no, it's just a nice number. And yeah, they're just, they're just strange looking. Don't stress them. Same thing happens with capacity. Capacity is exactly like we would have with the fluids on the US system. So in this case, we have liters. 
this is analogous to like the cups and the gallons, etc. So we'll have kiloliters, hectoliters, decaliters, deciliters, centiliters, and milliliters. And you notice that the unit itself is a capital L. They usually have that as a capital. I assume because a lowercase would just kind of look like a one and that would be messy. But that's my assumption. Well, we've already done that. I should have had that earlier. I should have had that earlier. <laughs> All right. So. What is happening there? Yeah. So converting metric units. Gonna write down a few of these real quick. Don't know if I gave myself enough room, but that's okay. So I wrote out a bunch of these guys. So the first one we have is 39.5 kilograms to grams. Now, the nice thing about the metric system is that as long as we start wrapping our heads around these prefixes, we can really just jump through these without having to memorize a bunch of different setups. So if I know that I have this many kilograms and I'm converting from gram uh, from kilograms to grams, I could say, okay, well, how many kilo, how many of one is in the other? Well, a kilogram kilo means a thousand. That is one thousand grams. So one kilogram is 1,000 grams. So we'd multiply it on like so. The kilograms would cancel out and we would have three, nine, five, zero, zero grams. We're just multiplying by a thousand so we can move the decimal three places. Kind of like scientific notation. Exact same thing happens on the next one. 52.32 kilometers into meters. Well, that's the same sort of thing as here, kilo, and then meters to meters is gonna be analogous to grams to grams. So we have this many kilometers. We're gonna be able to multiply that onto 1000 meters is one kilometer. Same sort of setup as number one, the prefix is what matters here. So as long as you start to re recognize those prefixes on these guys, the rest of the work kind of flows really well together. So in this case, we have 5,232,000 meters.
Now the next one kind of goes the other way around. We have 538 milliliters. Remember when we're breaking down our units here, the L is gonna have a capital. We have 538 milliliters. We're figuring out how many liters that is. Well, milli means one thousandth, right? It's the fractional one, it's the smaller one. So that means when I'm going from milliliters to liters, I'm gonna say, okay, well, for every one liter, there are a thousand milliliters. So it's kind of the other way around. Kilo is 1,000, but milli is 1,000th. So we have this, our units cancel out like normal. I'm gonna do this as a couple of different steps just so you can see it a little clearer. But we end up with 50, uh, 538 over a thousand in liters. And it turns out that you can actually just shift the decimal around and you get 0 0.538 liters. A little over half a liter. And after we've done a few, you can kind of see all we're really doing based on these units is we're shifting around the decimal point to figure out where it is in the new set of units. That's why metric is so, so nice to work with. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Well, now we have 3.7 grams into kilograms. Okay. Well, kilo, kilograms, that's a thousand grams. So if I'm converting these, I'd have to say that one kilogram is a thousand grams, like so. The grams will cancel out. You end up with this very sad looking fraction in kilograms. And just like that last one, the decimal is going to move over. So we end up with 0 0.0037 kilograms, almost nothing. If I'm just, you know, grand, grand scheme of things, 3.7 grams in kilograms, pretty tiny, almost nothing. So that's why you can see that if I started having thousands of grams, it'd be a lot easier to be working with kilograms, but not vice versa. Now number five, we have 0 0.8 kilometers to centimeters. Now let's go back to our slide on metric lengths. We're gonna be going from kilometers this guy to centimeters, this guy. Now, the one thing they all have in common right now is that they're compared to meters, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to convert from kilo, uh, kilometers over to meters, and then we can go from meters to centimeters. That's gonna be the easiest way for us to work that out, right? Okay, so 0 0.8 kilometers. And we've already done this type of math, right? Kilometers to meters. We already did that. Remember 1000 meters is one kilometer. Save that happening. Kilometers cancels out. And you have this thing times a thousand. So we end up with 800 meters. <clears throat> okay. Now we need to take this guy and convert that 
to centimeters. So I'm going to write out what I got, 800 meters. And then for centimeters, all you got to do is say, oh, well, one meter is how many centimeters? Centi is 100. Think of cents. How many cents are in a dollar? 100. Our, our, our money is almost in the metric system. Okay. Meters cancels out. 800 times 100. We end up with eight. With the four zeros stacked together, centimeters. So 80,000 centimeters. A lot of centimeters. Okay. Number six, I decided to make up a problem that had two units that I do not play with. 61 decagrams. Two decigrams. Oops. Okay. Let's go back and look at those units. So that would be in the metric mass. And we have that one decagram, which is abbreviated DAG, is 10 grams, and one decigram. Which is DG is 0 0.1 grams. Okay. So based on that information, based on that information, I'm probably going to convert this guy to grams first and then grams to this decigrams. So D, oops. D A G two G. So I have sixty one D A G. I'm going to convert that into grams. So I'm going to use this guy. So we have one decagram is ten grams. Okay, one decagram is ten grams. Okay, so we end up with 610 grams. And then we're going to go from grams to decigrams. So that guy, I'm going to kind of chain it directly in here because I'm running out of room. That guy, I know that one decigram is 0 0.1 grams. So one decigram is 0 0.1 grams. Okay. Grams cancel out. You end up with 610 divided by 0 0.1, which I believe ends up multiplying it by 10. Yeah. So you end up with 6,100 decigrams. Okay. Got one left of these guys. I did 124,163 milliliters to hectoliters. I don't know what the abbreviation is on that. Let's bounce it back over here. 
Yeah, it should be HL. Okay. So milliliters to hectoliters. So I know that one milliliter is 0 0.001 liters and one hectoliter is 100 liters. So I can take those pieces of information And take those pieces of information and work from there. So I'm going to start with my milliliters and we're going to convert it to liters. So I have one, two, four, one, six, three milliliters. And we're going to go to liters. So One milliliter is 0 0.001 liters. Okay. So it'll essentially shift over to the decimal point. So we end up with 124.163 liters. Right? So we're halfway there. We're in liters, we just need to get to hectoliters. Okay. I'm going to rewrite what I have 124.163 liters multiplied by liters in the bottom. Hector liters on the top, that way our liters cancel. One hectoliter is 100 liters. That is the ugliest one I've ever done. There we go. All right. Liters cancel. I end up with this thing divided by 100. Well, if I'm dividing that by 100, going to be smaller, right? Shifts over by two. So I get 1.24163 hectoliters. Okay. So overall, if we are just converting from one to the other, it's quite nice. Otherwise, when you're converting between one on one side and one on the other, you kind of have to do it as two steps. It isn't too bad, right? You just do it as one step to deal with one of your conversions and another step to deal with your other conversion. It can be very useful to write these out before you move on. I usually do. It comes in really handy to be able to just glance up to it. Okay, let's see where we're at. Three, four, I would have to go through four slides to get to the first example. I think we're gonna call it good until Thursday. It's a good time to call it good. So we're not gonna get to the percentages. There's no way I can cram, let's see, 25 to, ooh, okay. Yeah, can't cram 17 slides in the next few minutes. So we're gonna call it good. Uh, we'll pick back up here on Thursday. Thursday, we'll of course do some review over this stuff, then start off with the percentages. Other than that, I hope you guys have a good night. I'm going to go ahead and go home and go to bed. I advise you all to do the same. Yeah, of course.